Bible, actually look down at Luke chapter 10. Hunter, thank you. You bless me so much. He doesn't want me to talk about him, but looked up and he said, Pastor, before we move, I want to move the pulpit one more time. And I said, we'll let you move it a thousand more times if you stay, but... So far, I'm going to miss you guys. All right, look down at Luke chapter 10. Uh, what we've been doing is going through James. Last week, just looking at James 4 or 5, that the, the, the Lord yearns jealously for the spirit that he has put in you. And then there was a verse that I kind of just read by because I wanted to focus on it this week. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Or if you learned it the way I did, it said this, draw ye nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. You come close to God and he will come close to you. Well, all I want to do today is illustrate that one verse. Um, if you got a, a Bible, look down at Luke 10. And this is what I know about the God. God that you serve, the God that exists in reality, the God who is the great I am. Would you agree with this, that God is big and mighty and sovereign? Am I right? I mean, isn't that what the Bible reveals to us? A God that exists outside of time, a God within whom is life itself, that he can speak and all that exists is breathed into existence just by the power that he can say, let there be light and there's light. He can cause things to exist that did not a moment ago exist and bring those, and he's big. Uh, he can part the sea uh, without, with, with just the Bible calls it his strong right hand. He can just reach down and, and part the sea. He can raise the dead. Uh, he can stop the earth in its tracks and cause the sun to stand still. He is big and he is mighty. But in the midst of this big God that the Bible shows to us, don't miss this, that he's not only big and mighty and sovereign, he also is intimate and personal. And this big, mighty God loves you personally. He cares about you personally. And in fact, what we celebrate at Christmas time, it's not Christmas, but what we celebrate at Christmas time is called the incarnation, that God came down, this big, mighty, sovereign God, and he did a big, mighty, sovereign thing. He came down through a virgin, came down to us. And why? That he might have a relationship with us. In fact, get this. God not only creates all that exists with his mighty hand, he puts a man down there to walk with him and a woman there to walk with him. And every time you look at those big miracles of the Bible, there's always a person involved. God floods all of planet Earth, but there's one man. And eight people with that man that he's got a relationship with Noah and with his family. Remember that? Or, uh, or God, will, God, 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 God will cause the sun to stop in the sky, but there's a man named Joshua. And he's got a relationship with Joshua. Well, God steps down into time and history. One of the things you may not know about Jesus is he had friends. Uh, you just go, why wouldn't I know that? Because he said a lot of hard things that made a lot of people mad. One time, Jesus grew a church from 5,000 to 12. Uh, and that, that's, that's rough church growth numbers right there. Uh, five to 12, and then he said the 12 that were remaining, do you want to leave too? Remember Peter said, where else shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Well, um, one of the groups of people, the families that just had a relationship with, a friendship with, is the Lazarus family. In this family, there is uh, Lazarus, and he's got two sisters. What are his two sisters' names? You know this? M Mary and... Martha, we'll look down here at, at Luke uh, chapter 10, and then you put your finger in John 11, and I don't know, just keep up, good luck. <laughs> Do this, I just want to describe your relationship with God today, like kind of like the rooms of a house, you, you'll get it, look at this. Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him to her house, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. She is intensely interested as Jesus is talking. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, what does she say? Lord, do you not care that Mr. has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. That is one of the great Bible passages right there if you're a parent. If you're a parent, that you have had exactly this happen in your home 10,000 times if there's more than one child in your home. Am I right? A child comes to you and they say, my sister is not helping. Behold, she is wicked and lost from the foundation of the world. They'll say something like that. Am I right? Uh, why don't you make her help me? That, uh, what I like is the level to which 
which Martha raises the standard. She doesn't go to mom or dad. She goes to the creator of the universe, the sovereign one who commands angels, and she says, hey, tell my sister to help me. That's kind of raising the ante, isn't it? Uh, like, whoa, you went to, you come, hey, now you picture this from Mary's point of view, you complained about me to God? It's one thing when you just go to your dad in his armchair, right? Uh, in, in life, and especially in faith, you need both Mary's and Martha's. Am I right? Uh, Mary's are the worshipers. They're kind of the, um, the free-spirited hippies. Um, that's probably wrong. I didn't, uh, but, uh, but they're kind of, you know, uh, and then you've got the Marthas. And the Marthas are the workers, the ones that serve the, uh, how many, just out of curiosity, how many of you say, hey, I am a Martha. Are there any Marthas out there? Um, Martha is, uh, how many of you are Marys? How many of you are just not going to vote? Like, I'm not telling you what I am. Uh, <laughs> no Marys. Are not, like, nobody will volunteer. Like, I'm not going to be Mary. I know about Mary. Mary's the one that got in trouble in this, this story. Well, you just hold on and watch. Hey, um, Mary's favorite verse is, as the deer pants for water. So my soul longs after you. Martha's favorite verse is, faith without works is dead. That's kind of where they're, uh, well, let me do this. Let me just kind of take your relationship with God. And I, let me just describe it like a house, that you've got this relationship, you live with God in this house. And let's start here. Let's start in the kitchen. Uh, if you are going to have a walk with God, you're gonna, you're gonna have to spend some time with him in the kitchen. And that's just serving the Lord. Am I right? If you're gonna have a, great, hey, hear me. The one of the places you will grow the fastest in your faith is just serving and serving and serving Jesus Christ. Look down there at chapter 10, verse 38. It says that a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. Now, to be clear, this is a lot of work because you don't, you're all like, I would love to have Jesus in my home. Understand back then, everywhere Jesus went, his 12 best friends went with him. So it's not just that she had Jesus in her home. Hey, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Have a seat. You know, well, that's not it. It's Jesus and Matthew, am I right? And Thomas and Judas, not that Judas, and the other Judas. And there, I mean, there are 12 guys plus Jesus. That's 13. And they all need to be served. You know, Lazarus isn't helping. That's 14 men who all need to be served. And then... There's Mary, and she's not helping any. Um, I just love the way Martha is there, ready to serve the Lord. She's cooking, she's working. She, um, in church, you get a bunch of, you get a lot of people that are Marthas. They're the people that if you need something hung, that they're like, don't ask me to, to speak. But, you know, you need something built. You need someone to, to serve kids. We're there. They're the organizers and the planners and the deacons and the Levites and the, the people that just serve the Lord. I just started, it's dangerous if you ever start writing down people, you know, but I was just like, man, it's the, it's the Andrews and the Jimmys and the Duas and the Mikes and the Jets. Uh, you've not really lived until you show up at church one day and you see an open door. You're not really, you, you didn't even know that door opened. You kind of wander into that open door and there's a maze. I promise this is true. It kind of goes under the baptistry and you wander around under the, the baptistry, apparently in the church haunted house you didn't know you had. And you find way back under there, a guy named Jeff. And you say, Jeff, what are you doing in the church haunted house down here? I didn't even know this was here. And Jeff says, I'm just fixing the, the, the baptistry heater for you, pastor. Isn't that incredible? And just, uh, there's not really a haunted, don't get, don't get excited. Some of you are like, what? Um, it's, it's the Amy's and the Mitoyas and the Emrens and the Ashley's. And I, I don't know, didn't Curtis just sing amazing? It's, it's the, the Curtis's and the Cofields and the Cowles out there and the, the Claire's and, and the John. You say, which, which John? The Burks and the Tongs and the Bonnies and the David Hales and the Brian Branches. And I don't know. Oh, wait, wait, I got more. It's, here, hey, here's the great thing about a, a church full of Marthas is you start writing the names after page after page and you go after, wow, I don't have time for it. It's the, it's the baptism team. It's the Evas and the, the Pams and the Robins. Our, hey, our goal as a church ought to be this. We are gonna keep the most busy, like this is a busy church full of people serving God, right? Y'all, It's not that y'all are sitting around doing nothing. It's such you're working hard. Know which ministry we wanna work the hardest? The baptism team. We, let's wear them out um, baptizing. Uh, 
By, by the way, Jimmy's like, what, where you at? Jimmy's like, hey, we're on that baptism team too, um, going down in the haunted house and turning on the, it's, uh, it's a secret sign ministry, and uh, what's the secret sign ministry? Anyway, and, um, a guy named Zach, and he started thinking about the couples that serve together in church, you know, um, that just, just bless you. Just bless you, the, the Trissas and the Brandons and the Lorendas and the Ians, the Davids and the Brandies and the Grovers and the Melindas. It's the Josh and the Hannah uh, who go in there and they do an incredible Awana program, the Imran's and Selena's, the John and the Darla's. There, there's a lady here named, I don't know where she, where did Abigail go? Uh, there's a lady here, where? There you are, hi, right there. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes comes to two services just to encourage your pastor. You bless me. And then uh, during the week goes and does, does a ministry to the nursing homes just to bless and bring a service to them. Uh, there's the Bryans who do a, uh, a food for life. And, and there's some people, they just keep popping up. Am, am I right? You get an Amy and she'll plan a, a church picnic. And then as soon as the church picnic's done, she's over there setting up and getting ready for a new members class. And then as soon as the new members class is done, she's getting ready for a trunk or trees. There's some people that just pop. I'm, I better stop it with the list. But you get the idea is you have a church of Marthas that are just serving and serving. And serving. You get a guy like Brandon who comes in and just serves the Lord. Um, we were at Bible study. You know, see, he was up here a moment ago. Brandon is like, uh, we were in Bible study and Trissa came up and she kind of tapped me and said, he, Brandon was right in front of me. And she said, would you just get his attention? And I went to kind of flick him like that because why not pick on a deacon when you have the chance? I kind of went like that. And then I quickly assessed his size and decided not to hit him, flick him, or do anything else. I just leaned in and said, behold, Brandon, Trissa would like to speak to you. You know, Here's the, um, I got more on this list, but you get the idea. Um, here's the danger for the Marthas. You get people and they've got growing relationships with Christ. One of the ways you grow is by serving God. But the danger is you get distracted. And you forget there's other rooms in the house. And uh, look down there at verse 40. Martha was distracted with much serving. What's the Lord say to her in verse 41? The Lord answered her, Martha. Notice it's, it's a double use of the name. Martha, Martha in the Old Testament, that means God's going to call someone. Uh, he's called Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, Isaac, Isaac. The double use of the name in the Old Testament is a calling. In the New Testament, it emphasizes that something intimate is about to be said. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for it. Uh, that, so in Jesus, when Jesus uses a double use of the name, he's about to speak deeply to their soul. What does he say, Martha, Martha? Now he just looks right at her heart, looks at her heart, he says, assesses it, and he says, you are troubled and anxious about many things. There is more than just the kitchen in this house. If you, it, it, would you all agree with this? If you serve without worship, you get cranky. Am I right? Uh, you ever met somebody, they just serve and serve and serve and serve, and after a while, they got a little bit salty. Like, how did that happen? They, just get, they start to get resentful of the other people in the house. Uh, you, you know, just drains you of joy. Yeah. By the way, you're like, well, without serving do. It makes you spiritually weak and fat. That's what it does. Um, but not only do you need to spend time in the kitchen serving the Lord. Uh, amen, church. You're like, amen, that's us. Um, you also have to spend time with them at the table. And when you come to the table, that's the word of God, that you come and you eat and you feast with the Lord. And if you're gonna have a growing relationship with Christ, if you're gonna come near to God and he come near to you, you have to eat from the word. Look down there at verse 39. Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to him teaching. You go, I would love that. I would love to sit at the Lord's feet. I would learn to love, love, love him. And uh, hey, hey, hear me. Every time you read the Bible, you're sitting at the Lord's feet learning from him. And every time you choose not to read the Bible, you're choosing not to. Can you imagine Mary just there soaking in everything Jesus says? I mean, this is God on earth talking. And, and she's listening and Jesus is talking. And it's just soaking into her soul as she leaves everything that he says. And, and kind of behind her, there's Martha and there's pots and that bam, slamming pots down. And that's, the, that's the scene. Ever have a... Um, Ever have a bunch of guests in the house and then you've got a family member who thinks they're a guest? And you're like, hey, let me tell you reality for a moment. You're not a guest, you're a family member getting that. That's kind of Martha standing there. What are you doing? Going over there. Um, the why is she at Jesus' feet? The typical place for a, a 
learner, for a disciple, for a student, is at the feet of the master. The interesting thing is first century rabbis didn't take women to, to, to be disciples or to be students. Uh, Jesus is going to let her sit right there and learn right from him. Um, the Bible is our spiritual food. You want to come and you want to receive from God. I, I started thinking about the number of times. Stop it. Come to the table. Eating from the word, uh, I started thinking about the number of times the Bible is described as food. It's described as, <laughs> y'all like bread? I did a diet one time that took all bread out of the, um, the planet, which, uh, what you, by the way, two things, uh, you will lose weight and you will break some relationships. That's what happens if you don't eat, if you don't eat bread. That'll, that'll mess you up. Uh, the Bible describes itself as bread. It's described as honey. It's described as milk. Uh, Peter crave as a newborn baby craves milk you are to crave the great spiritual milk of our god um i i if you love milk i love uh you got to watch it they put an expiration date on there and that's dead serious i will not look uh people in my house are like it's good one day after i'm like you only have to have a bad experience once i would i would rather uh put diet coke on cheerios than risk it with with you know milk that i'm just not not sure about. My favorite description of the Bible when you go to food is not just milk or honey or it's that it is described as what is it guys? The men are like we already know this one, meat. Me and not um not bologna, not spam. Uh, it amen. It is just it's like steak, it's like ribs. It will fill your soul. Let me I kind of I love the way that, 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 that she's going. She's just taken in from Jesus. That's how your Bible reading should be. Can I just give you this picture of what, what your time with the Word should be like? It's like sitting at the table with the Lord. That you come and you're talking with the Lord. Ever, um, ever go to your grandma's house? And you guys got grandmas? Let me, let me help you. This will make sense in just a moment. What do you do at grandma's house? You play skip bow? See, you guys don't have grandmas. Do your grandma, you eat? Play, you ever play Uno? You find out she cheats at Uno? <laughs> ever sat a little longer, the games get put away, the food, the food is, and she starts talking. And um, my grandma starts talking about back there in the old country. The old country is like Arkansas. Starts talking about Arkansas and something called a dust bowl. The dust bowl was when they had so overworked the ground that it just picked up and the wind just blew the ground away and the farmers couldn't work the ground anymore. Uh, my people were sharecroppers. Sharecroppers are farmers that don't own the land. And so when you can't work that land, you don't own that land, you're up and you're out. And uh, John Steinbeck wrote all about this in a book called The Grapes of Wrath. People picked up out of Oklahoma, out of Arkansas, out of that entire area uh, during the Dust Bowl, and they came to a land of milk and honey called California, uh, more like and granola. But anyway, they came to California and wandered out here. And I would love to hear my grandmother tell those. Now, get this. I can read John Steinbeck uh, tell me about, about the grapes of wrath. I, I can read him tell me about the grapevine and all of that. I, I, I can read a history book. But there was nothing like just sitting with my grandma and hearing her tell those stories about coming across the country. And to us, we just get on the freeway and go. But it was different back then. And she'd tell those stories about those long journeys and you would just soak it in. In. Get this, when you read the word of God, the way some of you have messed it up is you started thinking you were reading a history book, you were reading a list of names, but instead what you are is you're sitting at the table with your God, with your friend, and he feeds you from his mouth at that moment. And the word of God is not just a history book, it's the world from God's point of view. And God says, let me tell you about the time I parted the sea. Let me tell you about the time I stopped the earth in its tracks and the sun stood in the sky. Let me tell you about the time I raised a man from... And you're just sitting there receiving and receiving and your soul is suddenly full if you'll spend some time at the table. But you don't just need time in the kitchen, time at the table. You gotta go somewhere else. Sometimes you just gotta get out alone. Any of you, uh, are any of you back porch people? You just kind of gotta get out in the back porch away from the kids and the noise and see a lot of heads nodding, male heads. <laughs> like, yeah, get out there. You know, that back porch to me is like prayer. 
It's just where you go, where you got to quiet down. Um, you got to respect Martha, that at least what she does is she brings the problem to Jesus. Lord, don't you care? Think about the number of times somebody would say to Jesus in the Bible, do you care? The disciples one time woke Jesus up in a storm and they said, care ye not that we drown? Martha brings what seems to us kind of like a small problem. Don't you care about my sister? She's driving me nuts. The porch is that place where you buy it, where you get away, where you can talk deep to the Lord. And what you'll find about Jesus himself is his great secret was prayer. Every time they went looking for Jesus, he was praying. One time, 5,000 people went looking for Jesus. They found him, he was praying. Uh, before he started his ministry, 40 days and 40 nights, he spent praying to God. Uh, when he went to Gethsemane, before he went to a cross, he spent the night praying. So he just said to his disciples, just pray with me. Just, just pray. Go to the cross. And on the cross, what's he doing? He's praying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He's praying and he's praying and he's praying over and over, just giving these things to, to the Father. And what, um, what jumps out at me of all the things the disciples asked Jesus to teach them, because they were there for all these great moments. They were there when he raised the dead, when he healed the sick. They were there when he healed the leper. And they never came to him and said, hey, would you give us a Bible study on raising the dead? That's, that looks awesome. Teacher, how, how do you do that? How do you drive out deep? They never asked him any of that. The only thing they said, teach us, was this. They said, would you teach us how to pray? Because somehow they knew if we know how to pray, that seems to be your secret is prayer. And what he taught them was phenomenally intimate. You want to pray? It starts this way. Abba, Daddy. I just go to my father and I talk to my father. In fact, it's the way he prayed in Gethsemane before he died, Abba, Father. If it is your will, take this cup from me, but if not, right? It's just the way that he prayed that he would talk to the Lord. Um, I, I would say this to you though. Wherever it is that you spend the most time, because I, hopefully I hit one of, some of you are, are porch people, you're praying all the time. Some of you, some of you are, you're just in the kitchen and you're serving all the time. Some of you are always in Bible study. And I would just wanted to kind of wake you up to this, that whatever room you spend most of your time in, there's other rooms of the house. Isn't that what Jesus does with, with, with Martha? He says, hey, there's other rooms of the house. There's other ways to serve me than just, just one. And can I emphasize this? God loves spending time with you. What is it that James said? Draw near to God. And he'll what? Well, you go, oh, you? Again, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. He loves spending time with you. Martha is distracted with serving, comes to Jesus and says, would you just tell my sister to help? Kind of like Jesus is gonna be impressed with the food they serve. Hey, um, Jesus knows what it is to have angels attend him in the wilderness. He's not gonna be impressed by the cooking skills of a girl. You know, but what she can give him that the angels can't is the depths of worship from the soul. Um, come over, I go to your house, knock on the door. Some of you are stressed already, like, whoa, whoa, what, what do you want? Say, hey, how are you? Could we talk? And you're like, whoa, hold on. Wow, look at the mess this place is. And you pull out, <laughs> vacuuming. Hey, guys, clean up, clean up, clean up. David's here, Pastor's here, and you're going everywhere, and you're rushing around. By the way, number one, I want you to know this. Your messy house blesses me and my children. But anyway, uh, you're rushing around. You're cleaning. You're mopping. You're like, oh, what are we going to do? And you're right. What would I say to you? Stop. Whoa, 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 stop. I don't need the house to be clean. I just came over to see you. Um, got some Doritos? Some Diet Coke? Because, amen. <laughs> I'm most excited anybody got in church. Because only, Jesus says only one thing is necessary. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. What's the one thing that's necessary? You, just you. You get distracted by all this. Look down there, verse 42. Mary has chosen, this is my favorite line in this whole, this whole account. Mary has chosen the good portion. Jesus is the good portion of life. 
If you're serving minus Jesus, you're miserable. If you're worshiping just for the ecstatic experience of worshiping, you're miserable. If you're, if you're out on the porch and you're praying just to be seen by men, you're miserable. But if Jesus is at the center of what it is you're doing, your heart is filled because it's the good portion. Mary has chosen the good portion. And I love this, which will not be taken from her. She's chosen something good to sit at my feet and to worship me. She's drawn near to me and I've drawn her and I'm not gonna kick her out, Martha. I'm not gonna send her away. What she has is a relationship with me. Well, do this, look down there at, uh, if you've got a Bible, just look at John chapter 11. Let me, let me just show you something that I, th- I, I thought was incredible as I thought about this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Your relationship with Jesus is what's gonna carry you through life. Your relationship with Jesus is what's gonna carry you through life. Because there's gonna be, in, in any life, some phenomenal moments, but you're also gonna hit some dips and valleys and some breaks. And if you don't have Jesus walking with you, it'll break you. Though I walk through the shadow, valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because I'm awesome! Is that what he says? I'll fear no evil because thou art with me. You're here, you're, you're with me. Your relationship is what, what keeps me going. Um, can't you this? The more you know Jesus, the more you'll love Jesus. So a growing relationship with, Je- that's not true of everybody. Uh, some people, the more you know them, the more likely you are to block them on social media. And by the way, if you block them on social media, you're like, that applies also in person. But, uh, but Jesus isn't that way. The more you know Jesus, the more you'll love him going through, uh, remember those old picture books that we used to have in churches? Uh, Olin Mills would put them out and you'd have a picture of everybody in the, in the church families uh, at my grandfather's house. And I was going through that Olin Mills book and spotted a guy by the name of Bill Suff. And I looked up and they had just finished his trial. He was the Lake Elsinore serial killer. And I looked up and I said, Grandpa, Bill Suff right here, church directory. He said, yeah. Came to church every week, sang in the choir. He was also a serial killer. So Sunday morning, singing in the choir. Monday, a little bit rougher. So I would just say this. Some people, the more you get to know them, the more distance you want. That's not true of Jesus. Hey, the more you know Jesus, the more hungry your soul becomes. The, it's not that you ever go and you say, my soul is satisfied. But after a long time with Jesus, suddenly you say, I need more of him. More of Jesus. Um, John 11, Lazarus is ill. And the sisters send word to Jesus, the one that you love is sick, he's ill. And Jesus says this, this sickness will, will end in the glory of God. Oh, what? He's gonna die. It says in chapter 11, verse five, look at this, it says, Jesus, look at this line, he loved Martha and her, and her sister and Lazarus. But he stays. In fact, he shows up four days after they've buried Lazarus. Look down there, uh, chapter 11, verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, they've had the burial, the graveside. He's dead, dead, dead. Out comes Martha. Really wound up is her personality. Out she comes. She's going to confront Jesus. This is going to go well. She went out to meet him. Look at verse 21. What does Martha say? If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Slightly confrontational. I prayed and you didn't answer. She actually says what many Christians want to say. They just don't get the chance to say it. What what are you doing? I don't understand. Now she expresses amazing faith. This is John 11, 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. She's got great faith. She suddenly looks at Jesus and says, I don't know what you're doing at this moment. I don't get it, but I trust you. I trust you and I trust your relationship with God because you've never dropped me. And even now at the worst moment of my life, I know that you've got a relationship with God and I've got a relationship with you. Look at what Jesus says in verse 23. Your brother will rise again. The next verse is almost comical. Uh, She says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. The reason that's funny is she thinks she's having a theological discussion with Jesus about the resurrection of the dead. He's having a personal relationship with her. So she suddenly goes theological on Jesus who, I mean, can slightly tear her up theologically. Am I right? He's not talking to her theologically about the timing of the resurrection. He's just talking to her. Martha, your brother will rise again. What does he say in verse 25? I am the resurrection. This is personal. 
This isn't suddenly, uh, I mean, it's deeply theological, but for her at that moment, it's personal. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he makes it really personal. He looks right at her. And he says, do you believe this? What? Do you, do you believe this? Now listen, that's incredibly personal, a little short on answers. She comes, why, why, you wait, why, 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 which is where we are when we suffer. Life hits some bumps, like why, why did that happen? Why did my husband, why did my wife, why, why that? Why did they die, why, why? And so often, God doesn't answer all of our theology. What he does is he says, do you believe? Do you? Do you believe? Do you trust me? Jesus, I think, would say, look, Martha, me and you, we have a relationship. Rest at this moment, lean on that. You ever leaned on your relationship? In the worst moment of life, you're gonna have to lean on your relationship with God. We're in an old building, last church, not this church, old building. Um, one of the deacons there was a guy named Forrest. He was a builder, and he looked at that old building and said, this thing, this, this is gonna fall down. Uh, so we immediately did not listen to him. We're having a deacon's meeting in there. And uh, another deacon there by the guy, the guy's name was Bill Nelson. And as they were talking, Bill was, <laughs> Bill was drinking coffee and leaning against one of the walls. And I kid you not, I guess they built them kind of like frame because uh, as he was leaning against that wall, the, an entire, not, not, like, not like a movie where like the section of his body fell through, just the entire, you heard it happening to it. And Bill kind of turned around like that, having leaned on it, and an entire section of that wall just fell right out of the building, right? Forrest said nothing. He just kind of looked up and raised an eyebrow. What do we do? You do two things. You get out quickly and you demolish the building. That's what you do. That's what you do. Because it could, um, when life hurts, what, what, what are you going to lean on? Because some of you have a worldview that feels good, but it can't take any weight. It looks good. It's, um, if you walk with the Lord, there's a reason he's called the rock. There's a reason that he's called the cornerstone. There's a reason he's called the sure foundation. Because you can lean on him in life's darkest moments. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, do you, me and you, do you believe this? What is Paul's conviction? And she says in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ. You've got it figured out. You're going to take care of it. The son of God who's coming in to the world. I mean, what carries her at that moment of her life? It's her relationship with Jesus. When life falls apart on you, what's gonna carry you is your relationship with Jesus. She didn't have all the answers. She didn't even understand everything that was gonna happen. She didn't know what Jesus was doing. She knew one thing. Jesus loved her and she loved Jesus. And that carried her. That's carried me through a lot of life. Look down there at what happens next. Look at, uh, what is that, verse 28? Mary shows up. I love it. As soon as Mary shows up, you know it's going to be dramatic. Get some popcorn. Get ready. This is going to be great. She's loud. She's dramatic. She's fun. She comes, and what, what verse is this? Look down there at verse 32. She falls at his feet, throws herself down. So different from Martha, isn't it? it by the way, isn't it cool? Every time you see the sister of Lazarus, she's at Jesus' feet. She's at his feet uh, learning. She is at his feet uh, at the tomb of Lazarus, and then she will be at his feet a little bit later anointing him with oil. She throws herself at, at his feet. What I love about these people, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, is they took advantage of what was, what, what was available to them. And what was available to them was a relationship with Jesus. And so many people today don't take advantage of the, relation, of, of the opportunity that's available to you, which is a relationship with Jesus. Look at Mary says, uh, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. <laughs> Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. He's, he's angry. Go to the tomb and he says, roll. Remember this? Roll, roll away the stone. And they object. He said, whoa, whoa. it's been four days. He's going to stink. Not worried about that. Um, roll away the stone. And it says Jesus cried out in a loud voice. You know why he speaks in a loud voice? Because he's speaking into the realm of the dead. Calls out in a loud voice. And he's very specific in the way that he speaks. Lazarus! Most scholars think the reason he said, he doesn't just say come out. 
Okay, why does he say come out? I'll give you some theology right here. Because at the voice of Jesus, the dead are raised. And some scholars said, hey, if he had just yelled come out, you could have had the entire general resurrection right there at that moment. Everybody came out of their grave at once. So he's very specific. Lazarus, come forth. And the dead, by the way, you ever think about this from Lazarus' point of view? This story stinks from Lazarus' point of view. He dies. He's been through this long sickness. He finally gets to heaven. He's welcomed into heaven, sitting at the great feast, at the great banquet. There's Jacob. There's Isaac. There's Abraham. There's Moses. There's finally set in front of him good meat. And he reaches down to eat. And he hears coursing across the courts of heaven, Lazarus. I think he showed up when they unwrapped him. He said, what? What? Why am I back here? Calls out, Lazarus, come forth. And I love this, with just his voice, Jesus raises the dead. Doesn't run in, doesn't, I saw this movie that had to put a bunch more in it where Jesus goes in and kisses and said, none of that. Just his voice, he raises him from the dead. Verse 44, the man who had died came out. Notice his hands and his feet are bound with linen strips. His, faith is, his face is wrapped with the cross, the cloth. Jesus says, uh, unbind him. Let me ask you this. Those ladies, that had to be the happiest day of their life. What carried them through the dark? What carried them through the shadow of the valley? So it, wasn't, it was their relationship with Jesus. Do you have a relationship with Jesus that'll carry you in the valleys? That'll carry you when a spouse gets sick? That'll carry you when finances get tight and when life breaks? Hey, hear me. Jesus will carry you on the darkest day of your life. And on the darkest day of your life, you probably will have no idea what God is doing. The women didn't. They didn't know what God was doing. You just have to trust him in that hour. You gotta trust him. John chapter 12, one, one last story. They're having a banquet. I think it's Lazarus' resurrection party. Because I, I, I think when you get raised from the dead, you have a party and you eat. Ever notice everybody raised from the dead is hungry? Apparently, death and resurrection makes you awesomely hungry. It's the first thing Jesus would say about somebody is give them something to eat. Um, they're at this party. Lazarus is there. Martha's serving. By the way, who's still not in the kitchen? Mary. And in comes Mary. And you know it's going to be dramatic. It's going to be beautiful. Because she has taken this ointment that costs her so much money. And she breaks it open and she gets down at his feet. And she just starts anointing his feet. Because she is so overcome with thanksgiving for the relationship she has with Jesus. Thank you for raising my brother from the dead. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for that time that I sat and just took and took and took as I sat at your feet. It just pours us away. Judas speaks up. He says, you know, we could have taken that money and given it to the poor. And Jesus says, why don't you just shut up? That's the David trying. That's not what he said. You know what he said? You always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. What she's done, she did to, to anoint my body for burial. In other words, when he says she did this to anoint my body for burial, saying she doesn't know it, but this gift means more to me than she could ever know. Because my body won't have time to be, be prepared for burial. Hey, I want to come on up, praise team. I, I just want to do this. I just wanted you to make you aware today because uh, one, that you spend time in a room of the house. And whatever room of the house you spend time in, I want you to kind of evaluate this. If you spend all your time in the kitchen, some of you, you're kitchen Christians. Um, I just wanted to invite you to the table to remind you to read your Bible, to study and to worship. Some people spend all their time studying worship and you need to be invited into the kitchen where some people are busy and they're working and come to help. All of you, hey, you cannot skip time on the porch. You cannot skip time on the porch. Amen? Amen. You have to be people of prayer. Talk about rooms of a house. Isn't it the way Jesus described inside? Say, how do I get in that house? Jesus said, I'm the door. I'm the door. You come in through me. Hey, some of you, you've been working so hard you actually just needed somebody to remind you how much you love Jesus. Uh, others of you, you just need to be invited to serve. But this is what I know about almost all of you. You carried life into this room. And life is heavy. Marriages are heavy. Don't say amen. 
when friendships get heavy and you just need somewhere to go lay, um, parenting gets heavy, and sickness gets heavy, and you need somewhere to come and lay down your burdens. I just want to give you time here to do that, to make decisions for Jesus, to rededicate your life, and some of you just to come to this altar and to pray. Would you stand? And you come as we sing. Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmsbaptistchurch.com.